tonight on Revolutionaries. Here's an agency created after Sputnik, specifically created to prevent that kind of technological surprise. You know, we exist not to do those incremental things that are very necessary. We exist specifically to do the, the technologies that, that allow for big steps forward in capability. DARPA is the Pentagon's high-tech laboratory. Today, DARPA is led by Dr. Arthi Prabhakar, a Caltech PhD with decades of Silicon Valley experience. Tonight, she explores DARPA's past and future and her own personal journey with John Markoff of the New York Times. Major funding for revolutionaries is provided by the Intel Corporation. I could spend the entire evening talking about uh, the impact that DARPA's had on the Valley. Um, you know, countless graduate students have had their careers launched by being involved in DARPA. Um, uh, you know, if you went through the, uh, the Computer History Museum exhibit, it's a little bit like a DARPA filing cabinet, I think. <laughs> um, DARPA did not fund the invention of the mouse. Bob da Taylor did that when he was uh, at NASA as a pro project manager, but then he came to, to, uh, to DARPA, to ARPA at that point, and he funded Doug Engelbart to do the online system, and that had this huge impact that flowed through the Stanford AI Lab and into Xerox PARC. Um, ARPA funded the Stanford AI Lab. Um, ARPA funded Shaky, the world's first autonomous robot. Um, ARPANET, of course, had a little impact on the world. Um, <laughs> One thing that I think we've forgotten is the BLSI design methodology yeah, that was done by Mead right. and Conway was ARPA, you know, funded. Um, and, and Lynn Conway was actually a program manager at DARPA and, for a while, right? right? That's right. right. And, you know, so basically the modern semiconductor industry came out of DARPA funding. Um, John Hennessy and David Patterson's work on risk, yeah. which had a huge in, impact. Um, Jim Clark's geometry engine, uh, which led to SGI and then acquired MIPS. And so, you know, I could just I could keep going, but but um, we'll get to that. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, start by uh, by asking you. Uh, so, how did you come to grow up in Texas? <laughs> Um, well, first, I just want to say how great it is to be back home in Silicon Valley and to see a lot of familiar faces, but also uh, it's always so exciting to see people who've been part of the DARPA community over a long period of time, so this is terrific. Uh, how did an Indian kid get to grow up in Lubbock, Texas? Well, not surprisingly, it was because my parents came here from India uh, to go to school. Uh, the unusual part of our story was my mom was the one who wanted to come, and uh, she was a social worker. But my dad was uh, the classic story. He was an engineer and uh, got a PhD late in life from, the, from Southern Methodist University, got a faculty position at Texas Tech, and there we were in Lubbock, Texas. Not, didn't TI make things in Lubbock? Wasn't Texas? They did. Uh, he worked for TI in Dallas, uh, but at the time that we moved to Lubbock, I don't think TI had a factory then. He, was, he went to, for a faculty. Okay position there. Yeah. And so you, your parents were pulled to America. They weren't pushed. Yeah, they came absolutely. because of the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. and they, they were lucky enough to have the resources to be able to do that. Yeah. And, if, and like many others, of course, they came thinking they would be here for a few years and turn around and go back. <laughs> and, you know, that was 51 years ago. <laughs> so in terms of culture, in one of the interviews I read, um, you're, you, you said that your mom would start sentences, quote, when you get your PhD. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Are there any other Indo-Americans in the audience? I, I bet I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are other people in the room who, who grew up with that. Yeah. But it wasn't a joke. It was just sort of a, you know, but of course. And in Indian society, where does that come from? I mean, was there, is there an educated class or? Well, I think the education is a, is a big priority, I think, in lots of families uh, around the world and in India. But of course, the people who came here in that generation came for an education. My mom was the first woman in her family lineage to go to school outside the home. Uh, her mother was considered overeducated because she had learned to read and write. And so my mom had this tremendous opportunity and went out in the world and went, went to college and got, got this education and even came to the United States. And I think she always just saw that as a, uh, that was the purpose of life, was to go learn something and then make the world a better place, and that was imbued in us as kids. So, so you were in high school before personal computers? It was yeah, a, I was in high school well before personal computers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, got, it's all gotten kind of vague. <laughs> it's all sort of vague out 
there. So let's see. So when I uh, my first job after graduate school, I went to uh, the this congressional agency, the Office of Technology Assessment, and that we had a word processor there. So that was okay. 1984. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Does, the, the, yeah. So <laughs> you never went. I mean, you sort of grew up before. You didn't grow up in a hacker culture. In, in, I did in not the good, grow up in, in, the, the, in the good hacker sense culture. of the word. The, 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 no, I really. I mean, I, let's see. I I went into engineering because. Um, well, partly because it was this sort of cultural expectation, but fortunately for me, I also loved it. And, uh, you know, I, I went through school at a time when it was very unusual for girls to do science and math and engineering, and, you know, I'm sort of obstinate enough. I'm contrary enough that I probably fueled it, right? So that was, people thought that was weird, so I thought, okay, well, let's go do that. You went that from was electrical it. engineering to applied physics, though. Yeah. What, what kind of trajectory you know, was that? that? What that was all about, I went to Caltech for graduate school. Uh, along the way, I had had this wonderful fellowship at Bell Labs. That was, you know, Bell Labs was a different thing back in those days. And I had a wonderful mentor there. And he said the most important thing when you go to graduate school is to get a great thesis advisor. Uh, he said, you're going to live with this person for all these years. Make sure it's someone that you can really, you know, do work with for an extended period of time. That was pretty good advice to get. I don't think a lot of kids got that in, in, no. you know, in this sort of um, narrow engineering worldview that we usually were exposed to. So I found a wonderful thesis advisor. He happened to be in applied physics. And so I said, OK, that's what I'm going to go do. But I, I got the sense that it wasn't all a, a walk in the park. As a matter of fact, I think you said your Caltech experience was the worst five years of your life. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Which is, oh my god, how frank. Well, I mean, was it because? Because it was super hard, or because you it were was woman? super hard. Yeah. It was super hard. I went to I went to Texas Tech as an undergraduate. Uh, I went to school with a bunch of other electrical engineering students, and it prepared all of us to go out and do useful work. And uh, you know, at the end of yeah. getting a bachelor's degree, it was not a great preparation for going into this super rigorous, you know, fundamental science-driven, hardcore graduate program at Caltech, which is what I ended up doing. Uh, and so I was just in over my head and. Um, you know, probably would have dropped out except for the great thesis advisor. Yeah. But, um, and I, I learned that, you know, my mother's expectation that I should get a PhD and then become a tenure track faculty member, it turned out that really wasn't what my life needed to be about. I, I didn't get that much joy out of being in the lab at two in the morning and having a eureka moment. I got a huge amount of joy out of going to a conference and telling, I remember telling an Intel manufacturing engineer about what my research had shown about transition metal diffusion into silicon, right? And that was satisfying because it actually, I, I was an engineer at heart. I really wanted to do work that connected and made a difference. And I wanted to go there. So I went a different direction. And so you were, you were involved in semiconductor uh, Physics design? Uh, I was a materials person. I was trying to figure out what was happening deep inside the semiconductor. And um, for my thesis, I looked at materials and you know what was happening with transition metals and silicon. I also looked at uh, indium gallium arsenide phosphide materials to try to understand how laser life was uh, being destroyed by defects. Uh, you know, it turned out I. None of that worked, so that's why I had to go do the second project. You know, that's, that's how research goes. So. Um, so, and yet when you, I would have expected it would have been very natural for you to be just sucked into the semiconductor industry. Yeah. Somehow you avoided that. Fear. Yeah. Was it? No, I, I, actually, I remember I interviewed at Intel when I was graduating uh, from Caltech. I just really wanted to try something different. I had been in this head down, focused research mode. And I really, I didn't go to Washington uh, out of a, I, I didn't have a conviction that I wanted to go do policy or I, I, I really just was trying something different because I wanted to get off of the known path. Now, PhD students from Caltech and lots of other places view that degree as a way to go do a whole host of things. Maybe it's research, maybe it's academic, maybe it's you know anything else. They, they go be management consultants, they go into industry. Right. Caltech at that time was much, you know, was much more, I, I think the view was, of course, you must go do research. And I think a lot of the faculty felt that way. My advisor, fortunately, thought that a PhD should enable you to go do whatever you wanted rather than limiting you. And one day he came in and he said, you know, we didn't know what to do with me. It looked like I might graduate. He was like, well, now what are we going to do with you? So one day he came in and he said, well, you know, why don't you go be a congressional fellow? And we had no idea what it was, but it sounded cool. And it was clearly off the beaten track. 
And so I applied and I got a chance to go. And that was, you know, was that off OTA, to the races. OTA that, that was the Office of Technology That's Assessment. Right. Yeah, they had a fellowship program back then. Yeah. Which is now no longer with us. Yes. Do you, I mean, that's a loss. That's, yeah. uh, could we use an OTA in the world today? Do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it went away in the mid 90s, and uh, it seemed to me then, and it seems to me now, that technology is probably still pretty important to how our society evolves and moves forward. So I think they did a lot of great work. And, uh, you know, other places are carrying some of that forward now, but yeah. it's a great place. So Switching to DARPA, um, you've had two tours. You were a, pro a, a program manager there, or is it project or program manager? Program manager, Program manager. Yeah. Which years were you first there? Uh, I arrived in 86. I was there 86 to 93, starting as a program manager. And right. did semiconductor things? Yeah, absolutely. I went to go work on digital gallium arsenide. Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> did it, I mean, so, I mean, at, at that point, uh, was gallium arsenide still, still con considered a candidate to be the future of semiconductors? Well, I think the people who were working on it thought maybe it was going to be the future of semiconductors. Um, at that time, there was a lot of interest in it uh, at DARPA because of its radiation hard properties. Uh, and so let's see, this is 1986. Now, of course, the silicon juggernaut seems completely inevitable, but at that time people were still talking about, you know, electron mobility is higher in gallium arsenide, which is, which is true, just not all that relevant if you want to build a big complex circuit. Yeah. But, you know, we, we learned a tremendous amount about the technology. We built a lot of the foundation that became very relevant for where gallium arsenide did, of course, blossom, which was RF devices and the whole, the whole mimic and, and uh, microwave world. But, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know, now I look back at my program managers all think I must have done something staggeringly amazing at DARPA. And I, and I got to do some good things later, but I certainly did not have a huge success with the first thing I came in to help Wasn't that drive. the era, didn't Seymour Cray build supercomputers out of Gollum? Yeah, that was and, all going on then. And yeah. was, was DARPA part of that, or was he doing it on? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I, I know that the, we interacted a lot with, um, with, with them. I don't remember whether we were funding them directly. Our work, my office, office at that time was funding uh, early pilot lines at places like Rockwell and McDonnell Douglas and wow. yeah. Bell Labs to try to build, uh, let's see, the first big thing was could you build a 16K memory out of gallium arsenide? <laughs> Isn't that sweet now? It's so sort of sweet to think about that. We did, yeah, we did. And do you, I mean, this is not what direction I want to go, but sort of what's DARPA doing these days in semiconductors? Is there? Yeah, it's a very different world. So I, in my time at DARPA, I started a new office. It was the Microelectronics Technology Office uh, because we had gotten enough electronics stuff going. At that time, we were doing uh, really sort of wrapping up the digital gallium arsenide work, but we had Semitech. We were making these investments in advanced lithography, did a lot of the early 193 nanometer work you know, to turn that into a real lithography technology, uh, a whole host of other things. But it was really interesting to come back 19 years later, and we have an office that's MTO. It's now the Microsystems Technology Office. It has some roots that trace all the way back to the office I started. But I, the world is so different, of course, because Moore's Law has marched along at this phenomenal pace, but is running out now. I mean, we're living the end of Moore's Law in various ways. Um, that you know, it's not news to anyone in the industry, but it's still sort of seeping in to the rest of the world. Um, the industry is, it was global before, it is now completely, aggressively, wholly globalized. Uh, that's very different. Now, you know, I, in the lithography world, just as an example, uh, I think TSMC now drove the last change in lithography technology moving to Immersion 193, right? I mean, when I was at DARPA 20 years ago, it was inconceivable that a non-American company would drive that. But of course, as the technology globalizes and manufacturing globalizes, the process is going to get driven from other places. So, so it's a very different landscape. The thing that is happening now in microelectronics that is incredibly valuable for the Defense Department is, um, it, you know, if you look particularly at one of the areas we care a lot about is what can you build in terms of advanced radar systems, just as one example. So. Um, we were doing work in gallium arsenide in the old days. Uh, after the digital period, there was a big mimic program in the Defense Department. DARPA was involved with that. Uh, that laid the foundations for these massive, uh, you know, very sophisticated uh, uh, electronic uh, arrays that are on, on our aircraft and on our ships 
uh, today. They're, they're, you know, that came directly out of that technology. What would an advanced radar do that today's radars don't? Uh, don't? What so, do you so want? So the, the current generation of radars that we use, of course, are the, well, these are these are these big apertures made up of these, you know, Gallimar sight arrays. That's the technology that's out there today, and that's what uh, a fighter uses to look out for this vast distance to see what's out ahead of it. It's also the system that's used for communications. It's the same system that's used to jam the other side. So it's, you know, integral part of shaping the electromagnetic spectrum in war fighting. The core technology today is Gallium-Mars side-based, tracing back to some of those early investments. But then today, the research that's going on um, is the next generation's gallium nitride technology, something that was just barely beginning in research when I left 20 years ago. Now it has come into full fruition, and the next generation of major uh, military radars are going to be based on, on this next stuff. generation of technology. Could you so. conceive of consumer applications? Cars now have radars. Yeah, Th no, absolutely. Stuff, uh, no, I, I mean, I think there's a very long history here, as in many other areas, where we made these investments for these defense purposes, and often those military systems, because of their aggressive needs, became the first applications, but then those technologies spilled over. So, the, you know, the gallium arsenide power amp that is in your cell phone, that is what talks to the cell phone tower, uh, traces back to the, you know, it, it went off on a different commercial path, but it has its roots back in that same core research that happened many decades ago. And I think similarly, the things that today are the bleeding edge of high-end military capability, some of those technologies too will be in cell phone towers and they'll be used in the world around us. One of the general questions I want to ask, so two tours at DARPA, yeah. how had the agency changed? Oh, that was, it was so, kind of, uh, that was the biggest question I had going back a couple of years ago because I was thrilled to get the chance to go back, uh, but I hadn't really had much interaction with the agency been off doing other non-defense related things for nearly two decades. And so that was the biggest question in my mind going back. And, you know, DARPA had just moved into a brand new building uh, a few weeks before I showed up. So it felt different. And um, technology had changed in dramatic ways in the toy. When I left DARPA in 1993, I didn't have a cell phone, right? And we, were, we still had to force our contractors to get email addresses. They were like, why do you want to do email? We don't get this thing. You know, it's hard to even imagine that. Uh, so the, the technology had changed, geopolitics has changed dramatically. We're coming through this period of two extended ground wars and a focus on counterterrorism. Um, when I left DARPA, we were just figuring out what it meant that the Cold War had ended, what, what, what was the world going to be like. It turned out it was a very, you know, in a lot of ways, a very confusing and complex world. So everything is different. But about two days after I got there, I realized that, that program managers are still just like running in the door in the morning with their hair on fire because they, are, they have something that they have got to do that's going to change the world. And that, so that's, I was so happy when I realized that the culture was still... Sound. And, and your customer, the Pentagon, have yeah. they changed? I mean, yeah. or the re relationship that DARPA has with, uh, is, is that changed? Yeah, no, I, you know, in a fundamental way, I think that relationship has not changed. Every one of my predecessors I talk to or that I read about uh, dealt with some of the same issues. You know, here's an agency created after Sputnik, specifically created to prevent that kind of technological surprise. Very quickly realized that the way you prevent surprise is you create your own surprises. But, you know, we exist not to do those incremental things that are very necessary. We exist specifically to do the, the technology technologies that, that allow for big steps forward in capability. Well, inherent in that is that most of our, mo you know, our most powerful new technologies disrupt the way that the military works. And so, you know, we have lots of people in the Pentagon who, when they see us coming, go, oh, here comes DARPA again. And, and fortunately, over many, many decades, we've built, I think, a very compelling track record, and so people with a little bit more vision will give us the time of day and we can start working. But it, it's not always easy to you know, shift to stealth technology or to move to precision guide, guided weapons or infrared night vision. I mean, those are not, you know, those are always hard challenges. So that, that remains true for the next generation of things we're working on. One thing that DARPA didn't do when you were there the first time around that they do now is they have these challenges. Yeah. Uh, started with the autonomous vehicle. I th think that was the first one. Yeah, right? And now you have a, a, a whole portfolio of challenges. I, I, I wanted to ask first about the rescue challenge. So DARPA has, is in the midst of this robot contest. That's right. 
And uh, have, you had, have you had a chance to step back? I mean, so the autonomous vehicle had uh, a challenge. It turned out to have this huge impact on the world that probably nobody would have, would have guessed in a way, that it just yeah. set the automobile industry on fire. <clears throat> Google took a lot of your technology. What might the robot challenge do? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was targeted, wasn't it? Wasn't it at Fukushima-like situations? But what are the second order effects that might yeah. come out of something? Yeah, no, like I think that? that's great because uh, first of all, a challenge is a great way to add to our portfolio of ways that we can interact and build the technical community. Uh, and I think you know it, it, it doesn't work for all situations, but it's particularly valuable when you've got lots of bits and pieces of the component technologies and you really just want to see what people can do today and just create an environment where they can head on, head on compete with each other and try to accomplish something that seems, you know, at the beginning it seems very, very, very hard. Uh, and of course the first DARPA challenge, you know, had no winners and then very rapidly afterwards we saw this huge step forward and, and the progress that was made because, you know, I think that's the the capability that it evokes. So similarly, I think with the DARPA Robotics Challenge, we had our, our um, trials last December. Uh, the finals will be in about another year. And at the trials, uh, uh, it was structured around disaster relief and humanitarian aid. So uh, robots uh, that were competing had to be able to cut a hole in a wall. They had to be able to climb a ladder. Uh, they had to be able to uh, drive a vehicle, um, uh, you know, all based on the kinds of things that would have been wonderful to have had in, in a Fukushima sure, kind of sure. situation. So you know, it was it was amazingly funny, actually. I thought to watch the robots in December because uh, scintillating moments of watching a robot walk up to a ladder and then spend six minutes like looking at the ladder. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you know, you realize where we are, and then every time a robot, you know, after wa watching it, would take a step or two, and then the whole crowd would say, "Ooh!" And, I, and it was amazing to see what they could do, but also very sobering to realize how limited the capability is today. I'm really sure we're going to see a huge amount of progress at the, by mean, the time of the final. One of the things about the first context is almost everything was teleoperated. Yes. And we almost saw they no auto autonomy. Very which little you autonomy. You guys wanted to foster autonomy and it hasn't really showed up yet. Well, I, I think it just shows you where we are. Ground robotics is just an incredibly difficult challenge. You know, the things you can do autonomously in the air or in space or even in the open ocean, I think, are going to be much easier. The ground environment is the most challenging. So that particular trial, uh, we, you know, we're all, they were all teleoperated. Uh, the, there was a, the bandwidth of that communications was, was being squeezed on and off to simulate an environment where you couldn't count on communications. Um, but what, the reason it took so long for robots to actually do anything was, you know, the operators were waiting and waiting and waiting to get enough of a picture from their, you know, from the robot itself of what was going on so that they could plan and then transmit instructions. Now I think that's also going to get a lot better by you know, the next time. That point about the ground challenge is a really interesting one because I think what what led to the first grand challenge is that Congress, I can't remember the year, but they mandated the third of the uh, nation's military uh, uh, land fleet be autonomous by 2015, which I don't think we're going to I don't think we're making it. Made. So all this good stuff came out of it, but it didn't actually yeah. meet its, its, uh, it's kind of an interesting yeah. Uh, right, well, you right. can't. You know, you, you actually you can have those aspirations, but as you know, those are those are not milestones you can just um, drive to. If you'll forgive the expression. There's, all, there's, all, <laughs> there, there's also been this this um, this fantastically interesting subtext to me. Um, DARPA put hundreds of millions of dollars into a company called Boston Dynamics, which arguably is one of the best robotic company in the world. And along comes Google last year, and yeah. they buy it. Uh, are you okay with that? I'm, I, I'm actually personally not only okay with it, but I think it's, I think it's a very promising sign. Uh, th there's a long history of DARPA making investments in technologies to show what's possible. Uh, and then when those technologies have commercial futures, uh, private capital and private companies and entrepreneurs are, they take the baton and they run that next stage with it. Uh, you know, we, of course we also work on a lot of things that are directly and only for the military and so the next stage looks different in that case. But, you know, so much of what we talked about here in Silicon Valley was exactly this, the spark at the beginning and then, it, 
really this much, much vaster set of investments and a much larger community that gets involved to start turning those technologies into products and companies and then industries. So, you know, time will tell, but um, robotics is, is, I think, very much in that, that category, a technology where we want to show it's possible, but it's going to take a massive private investment and real markets uh, to turn it into something that, you know, that has enough capability that, that can be purchased for a low enough price uh, that ultimately it will, I think it really will become something that helps the military tremendously. But I don't want to go it all alone anyway. So I'm, I'm hoping Google and others will go do great things with the technology. The, the other really wonderfully ironic thing that happened there was that the, you know, the best of the competitors so far is this company called Shaft. Yeah. And Shaft also was bought by Google. And uh, you know the, the reason that Shaft existed is because Japanese universities can't participate in DARPA-like events. And so these kids had to leave the university and they had to yeah, become. Yeah, isn't that a great story? And then along comes, and you know, there's a tremendous hand-wringing in Japan right now because basically Google picked off the BEX robotics technology. And I, I mean, I guess it's not a DARPA issue, but it's an interesting second order effect from the, from yeah. the you know, contest. Well, I'll tell you, I, uh, one of the things I talk, try to talk a lot about uh, with people in the Pentagon is trying to really show them how incredibly global technology is today. And I think this is a great example because here, here's a Japanese company formed out of Japanese university to participate in a defense department contest in the United States. And then, you know, it's acquired by Google uh, that this is what technology yeah. is today, right? And so now, wh wh where is the American part of that? And, and you don't get to actually draw those boundaries anymore. Well, and how does that play with the surprise issue? I mean, if yeah. you're, I mean, I, I keep looking for one of those kinds of international surprises yet, and we really yeah. haven't seen anything yet. But as the as the technology falls in cost, isn't it more yeah. likely that there's going to be some sort of surprise? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the landscape is just very, very different. One of the assumptions that we've, we had for decades was, in the national security context, the assumption was that the technologies that we developed in this country would be harvested for national security purposes first here. And, and you know, we always understood that, that over time these technologies would become global. But, you know, over and over again there would be American innovation that led to American companies serving American markets. And, and that could be something that lasted for years, decades in many cases, right? If you think about industry after industry. And, and then it globalized. And, and in a sense, I think we as a nation, for national security purposes, but more broadly in our economy, I think we had time to think about it and then adjust and then globalize. And of course, that's not how the next generation of technologies is developing. You see, uh, I think we still have tremendous research strengths here, so still often many things germinate here. That's going to start changing as well as the rest of the world you know, grows its research capacity. Uh, but the things that germinate here, um, you know, production can be global from the get-go. Small companies that we worked with uh, in the venture world, uh, when, when I had the privilege of doing that work, you know, the two founders of a company, but when, they, when they're thinking about markets, they're thinking about global markets from the very beginning. So that, that has huge implications from a national security perspective. In, in your testimony uh, uh, recently, you've talked about these ecologies, these research ecologies. And I, I, what, when, you, when you talked about the ecology, it made me wonder how fragile they are. Yeah, and, right. um, yeah I worry about that a lot. Do, do you, and, then, and so then what's DARPA's responsibility? I mean, I know that DARPA dir directors have gotten in trouble for flirting with industrial policy, and yet the reality is it's de facto industrial policy, isn't it, it whether we call it that or not? And There's actually an office of industrial policy in the Defense Department, ah. <laughs> the, because they're actually supposed to worry about, in, in that case, the defense industrial base. But yeah. uh, you know that, that's, a, that's a government-owned mission that, that we rely on the public sector to deliver, and I think that, that has traditionally been uh, uh, the driver behind a lot of the investments in technology. But what is DARPA's role? I think that's really your question. So first of all, for context, uh, DARPA's uh, budget is, what are we, about 2%, 2 or 3% of federal investment in R&D. Um, and, and we're even less than that if you think about the whole country, right? And, so and, we and just and have the oh, small sorry. piece, that's all. Oh, so so R&D, I'm always wondering what's R and what's D. Yeah. Of your 2%, how much is real R in the sense Yeah, of well, I don't know. You can have your own definitions of what it is. Um, 
if uh, so, we, we don't do product development. Uh, w the closest thing we do would be to build a you know a military prototype of a of a of a system. We we have a program called the Long Range Anti Ship Missile, for example, where last year we had successful flight tests. So that's that's a prototype stage. That's in within our portfolio. It was probably the most mature technology we worked on. The Navy's now driving it forward. Um, but that's on one end of the spectrum. The other end of our spectrum is much more basic research where we're trying to really discover if there are new insights about a new research area that'll open up technology opportunities for the future. So that, that's the world that we live in. Um, other parts of the federal R&D uh, investment, uh, you know, of course, include the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health. All of that is very research oriented. Part of it is weapon systems development. A lot of it is actually weapon systems development and DOD. That's much more like, pro that's more D, right? I mean, that's really building a product. Yeah. So it's a mix. But as you know, a lot of the R that gets done in the country is still from federal sources. Like, is there any, uh, you were talking about sort of seeing the end of Moore's Law. And yeah. is that on your horizon as a, as a DARPA director trying to push that out? Do you, are you spending dollars? Um, uh, it's, doing something about that isn't directly in our sights, first and foremost, because there's a $300 billion global industry that lives and dies by figuring out what to do about that. And um, it was number one, and then number two, I think that, that in that particular technology area, the next advances are going to be immediately uh, globally commoditized. I don't really see an opportunity for um, us to get a, you know, a national security ad advantage or edge. So there, I'm much more interested in the question of how do we become the, the best and fastest user of this global you know, continuing VLSI revolution. And then I think there's some very interesting questions that, about what, how will we continue to keep up with this flood of data and manage it in real time uh, when you can't count on just you know, Moore's Law giving you more and more gates forever. Uh, to do that with, and, and you know that opens all kinds of interesting questions about new architectures and new ways that you might want to start thinking about special purpose processors that, that for the classes of problems that we deal with, um, and that's a live conversation today is to try to figure out if there are places we should be thinking about there. One of your areas is the brain. Yeah. And one of the new areas. That's and very exciting. Also biology. But let's start with the brain. And I think, did you bring some yeah. multimedia yeah, if we could bring up, If we could just bring up uh, the, fir the first picture. So this is work that we've been doing. Uh, biology and how it is becoming, uh, it's, it's intersecting now with physical science and technology, with information technology. Biology is at a time where we think it's, it has enormous potential to become not just research, not just medical applications, but really the foundation for whole new powerful technologies. And our interest is turning biology into technology. So one of the areas that we're investing is in neurotechnologies. Uh, the work I wanted to share with folks is uh, work that we've been doing on brain function research um, that uh, starts with uh, about 10 years ago. One of our program managers at that time was Colonel Jeff Ling. He was a colonel in the Army, uh, a neurointensivist by training. He had served in Afghan Afghanistan and Iraq. He came back from theater uh, convinced that we had to find a better way to give prosthetics to our wounded warriors who had lost upper limbs. Um, because the standard of care still is just uh, a simple hook, something we've had you know, for many, many decades. Uh, Jeff started off uh, to build a program that had a couple of branches. One was simply to make a much more sophisticated mechanical arm with you know, many more degrees of freedom. And in fact, one of the very early versions of that just got FDA approval, uh, which is okay. tremendous. Okay. I think it might yeah. actually become the first thing beyond the hook to, that, that uh, people can use and really start changing their lives. But because Jeff also uh, is a neuroscientist, the second part of what he wanted to understand was how motor control in the brain uh, actually controls the way our limbs move. And so a second branch of the research was doing the work to understand uh, the, the neural signaling that, that leads to motor control. Those two branches of research came together over the last few years uh, as we just started the first few experiments working with human volunteers. Uh, and the first few folks have been quadriplegics who volunteered to have uh, chips implanted 
uh, to pick up their motor, sig motor cortex signals from their, the neurons firing that's going on and to try to use that uh, to control some of these, these new arms. Uh, and the series of things I, I wanted to share with folks, really I'd like to show you uh, how that field is moving. In 2002, when Jeff started this work, very wise people in the field said it's going to be 50 years before you can you know, directly neurally control a prosthetic arm. Um, and let me show you what's actually happening. So what we're, in this first video that you'll see in a moment, you see Tim sitting in the chair with the ball cap on. Uh, Tim uh, was injured in a motorcycle accident, and uh, he, he doesn't have uh, the use of his limbs. He volunteered to be the very first uh, human trial to get this implant. Very simple implant was placed on uh, his motor cortex. Uh, and sitting with him uh, in the background is one of the researchers at the University of Pittsburgh where the work was doing. And this young woman in the front, you can see her lovely tattoo. Uh, that's his fiance, that's Katie. And uh, the first thing you'll see in this video is uh, uh, very soon after recovery, uh, what Tim is able to do uh, with his with the prosthetic arm, uh, and then you'll see Katie get into the action. So why don't you go ahead and play that video? So he's just practicing touching different parts on that board. Baby, I want to hold your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I find the two of them very moving. That was about 20 minutes after uh, he started uh, trying to think and, and move, move the arm. So uh, he, he, you know, they would sort of train him by moving the arm and having him think in a way that corresponded to where the arm had moved. And that was, that was really the first time he was just thinking and moving the arm. So amazing that we were able to do that. A year later, uh, we were able to get uh, uh, our second human trial. Uh, and if you, you bring up the next image, this is a woman named Jan. Uh, she read or heard uh, in the local press in Pittsburgh, where she lives, that the University of Pittsburgh was looking for volunteers. Jan had been a quadriplegic uh, by that point for a number of years. Uh, decided to volunteer for uh, this surgery. She had a little bit more sophisticated array placed, and, and Tim was only able to have his array for a very short period of time, so we weren't able to get very far. Jan was actually able to have the array for an extended period of time, and uh, first we'll show you what she could do after a few months. Go ahead and roll this one. Five months after the surgery, we came back to see whether she would be able to control the robotic arm with nothing but her thoughts. They plugged her brain into the computer, and this is what we saw. I could move it up and straight down and left and right and diagonally. I can close it and open it, and I can go forward and back. That is just the most astounding thing I've ever seen. Can we shake hands? Sure. No, really? Yeah. Like, come right over here? Yes, you come over okay. there. Okay. You grasp your hand there. There we go. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And I can do a fist bump if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. What are you doing, Jan? What's going on in your mind as you're moving this arm around? What are you thinking? Okay, the best way to explain it is raise your arm. Uh-huh. Good. Now, right. what did you think about when you did that? Well, not very much. I do it all the exactly. time. Exactly. It's automatic. Is that hard work? 
Are you having to concentrate? It, no, it was hard work getting there. I struggled greatly to go up and down at the beginning. Now up and down is so easy. I don't even think about it side to side. Don't even think about it. Just like, Just like that. your arms used to. Yes. <laughs> and She is really amazing. And that was the moment that, that uh, the, my moment of wow when I first saw this was realizing that it was not, you know, she's not thinking about moving her right forefinger and then, you know, twisting her right, wrist. It's, it's that natural time. kind yeah. of control. And, you know, as Jeff Ling talks uh, about this, Jeff will tell you, and I think he's really right, that uh, we've opened a door uh, and we don't we're, we, we haven't stepped through it. We don't know what's on the other side quite yet, but it's a door that allows us to imagine freeing the brain from the body and the power of what it can do to restore function, I think, is very obvious. Um, but beyond that, of course, think about think about, uh, you know, remember how we've been revolutionizing the human machine interface? Yeah. Um, so programmatically, who what's knows the, where this could go? So, what are you doing, sort of next steps? I mean, you've, you've taken it here. So what, what I'll show you one one next step. But I think that you know, so so we're at a very interesting juncture because we pursue these technologies because of their power and their their potential. But at the same time, you can you can easily you know you can take a, a trip to the moon and imagine wonderful things. You can take a trip to a dark place and imagine yeah. some terrible things as well. So I think it's a good time to stop and think about where we are, what might be possible, and what might be the right next thing to do. But I want to show you one last clip. So this was a, that was about a year ago. Jen has been tolerating the implant very well. She's been doing amazing things. We got FDA approval to extend her time to continue to wear the implant. Uh, and then people said, well, gee, you know, she's really great with this one arm. What would happen if we gave her two arms? Now, you know, the very first thing you read in a neuroscience textbook is that the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. So go ahead and play the next clip and you can see what Jan's now able to do. We've got the two arms. Nice. Same connection very nice. to the same chip implant. Interesting. She's controlling both of them from yeah. the same? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Really nice. Uh-huh. Yeah, so Beautiful. just Beautiful. when you think you might know what the brain is doing, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it's so amazing as an organ and so plastic and so capable. Yeah. Um, so, we, we, you know, I, this is a great example of something that I know is going to be powerful in uh, over probably 20 to 50 years, and, and the first few steps will be restoration of function, but I think out beyond that, you can start seeing a lot of other things that are going to be possible. You've just created, separate from brain, although maybe it's within yeah. it, you've created this biological or biology technology right. office. So I heard your program manager speak at MIT at a synthetic biology conference. Yeah. What was striking to me about the conference is both the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI were there, and the FBI spoke. Yeah. To your point about the possibility That's of going exactly in, in right. dark, dark directions. Yeah. Um, but so. What are you, what are you, why did you create a biology technology office? Now you want to create these things as technology. What are you doing specifically yeah. with that? Separate so, from brain. Uh, DARPA's been investing in biology related technologies for 20 years, it's, you know, starting with biological defense technology, some of which are now out in the world and, and helping provide protection. Uh, but when, when I got to DARPA, I, I, I thought it was a very fertile area. I saw a number of programs that we were doing, the neuroscience. This is only one of about three or four amazing things that are happening in neuroscience and neurotechnologies. Uh, in addition to that, we're doing the synthetic biology work that you referenced. Um, you know, scientists have known for so long now that, that if, you, if you can engineer microorganisms and cultured cells, they can start producing all kinds of interesting chemistries and materials. We see enormous potential in that, but we want to turn it into a scalable engineering discipline where, you know, instead of costing many tens of millions of dollars and taking years and years to do one development of a new material or chemistry, can we really turn that into a scalable engineering practice? Well, so draw the analogy. So you were in school roughly around the time that Eden Conway created yeah. his VL design, design technology. When I was at that synthetic biology conference, it occurred to me maybe are they roughly the same place? Are they 10 years off? They, they might be. They might be. I mean, certainly we see the potential for 
uh, a kind of scale in the ability to um, manipulate and manage these, uh, these microorganisms. Of course, what's already happening, this isn't a DARPA story, but our ability to sequence and synthesize DNA is on these very aggressive cost curves. That's always an exciting sign when you see you know, technology being able to do those things. And that's an ingredient in the synthetic biology world. I, I, I think you know, I'm, I am inspired by what we have seen in lots of other engineering disciplines and the potential to, to unleash those kinds of trends in biology. I am also uh, chastened when I think about how little we understand about uh, biological evolved complexity as opposed to the kind of complexity the, that we designed as engineers in, in, the, you know, in the information world, in the microelectronics world. So uh, it's an aspiration, but I think we're gonna go about it in some different ways because of biology's relative strengths and you know, it's, it's, it's phenomenally capable at reproducing and surviving and adapting. On the other hand, it's, it's almost, it feels intractable compared to, you know, transistors or lines of code, right? So, so anyway, but that's, so brain work, uh, synthetic biology, work to fight infectious disease. Can we outpace the spread of infectious disease? Those are examples of biology-related things that we were doing already at DARPA. We scooped them together into this new office in order to give the area more focus and to start uh, engaging that community in a more, um, more focused uh, fashion. I think it's going to be a good experiment. I, this is very frustrating because I have about 20, what, 250 or so DARPA programs. Yeah, and lots I, I, of programs. There are about 20 I want to ask you about. I'm going to ask you about one and then I'm going to okay. go to the... I'll be short so you can get through lots of <laughs> so them. So the future of GPS, you have this technology yeah. called Cold Atom that I just started to read about that sounds fascinating. Yeah. Could you... Yeah, yeah, so first of all, GPS was this wonderful miracle. I mean, we're, we're all addicted to it. The military is addicted to it. But w because it's been such a powerful, uh, cheap way, once you put the satellites up, it's so cheap and easy to have that receiver and, and know what your position is and, what, and get accurate time. Uh, as a consequence, we've forgotten how we used to do PNT, position navigation and timing, which was layers, right? You'd have internal gyros and inertial navigation systems. You'd have external fixes. And you would layer all of these things together and integrate them and then figure out what your position and time is. So that's, we're going to have to go back to that with, with these huge advances in the underlying technologies, one of which is in timing. Uh, and in navigation as well. We're, we're finding ways to harness this utterly beautiful physics from a couple of decades ago. You know, a couple of decades ago, cold atom physics was starting to win, do the research that led to Nobel Prizes. And, uh, you know, so beautiful to think about cooling atoms by shining lasers at them, right? So they, they, they achieve these states where, where they're, they're in this sort of pure magical environment where you can start using them and tapping their atomic properties. So it was gorgeous science, but the people who lived in the world of position, navigation, and timing have also seen the seeds in that research, the seeds of huge advances in clocks uh, and, in, and in navigation systems. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing the last few years is how do you get these technologies from a huge room with optical benches and lots of sophisticated you know, PhDs to tend it, how do you start getting it down to a box, a shoebox that could be on a ship or on a submarine so that they would lose, you know, a nanosecond over a year or something. So. And give them a, an independent location uh, ability yeah. that's incredibly precise. Yeah, the ability to not drift in your time and your, and your position yeah. keeping capability. Uh, this would be totally separate from GPS. It would be like an inertial yeah. system. Or well, a, a, but again, really, if you, need, if you want to be able to navigate and tell time, you, you need a fix to, to, to lock to. And then, and then what you want is the lowest amount of drift for the longest amount of time, be it time drift or positional drift, right? So you need, you're going to need both. You're going to need the external fixes. You'll need new external fixes if you don't want to rely on GPS, and you're going to need these much more um, you know, low drift technologies. Are there sort of next generation drone technologies that are, DARPA was very involved in yeah. the origin. Yeah, we what didn't really talk about it, but yeah. you know, one, of the, one of the major areas of focus today for us is uh, this issue of completely breaking the complexity of uh, military systems, our massive platforms, our fighters, uh, our spacecraft, are these incredibly 
uh, very, very powerful, capable systems, but they are ungodly expensive, incredibly inflexible because of these complex subsystems that are all tightly coupled, you know, to build the next generation fighter, for example. Uh, we are looking for ways to continue to have much more powerful capability in the air domain in space, uh, in, in what uh, you know, a soldier carries on, on his body, but finding ways to do it that, that allows for uh, scale and an open architecture so that you can start um, you know, getting the benefit of all that complexity without just being killed by it. Now, as, as you start doing that, you know, really what we're talking about is using microelectronics and microsystems and algorithms and information technology, but instead of cramming it all onto a massive platform, there are now some pretty amazing things you can start doing by distributing capability and having combined coherent effects, for example, for jamming or shaping the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, when you, when you do all of that, it might open the door to some very interesting new platform architectures where you have a lot of small drones or unmanned systems that are able to cooperate and, and achieve very interesting mission effects. You guys have, here's a, here's a question, I think you have uh, some programs that deal with. Software is a very hard, hard to build, especially when creating large scale systems that might operate military systems. Yeah. What is DARPA doing to improve the software development process? Yeah, yeah well this comes right in. Muse, into, is Muse an example? Muse is a great example. But so number one, I think back to this issue of our tightly coupled subsystems, the software complexity gets just completely out of control and that's one of our big issues in cost and inflexibility. Uh, Muse is a new program uh, that, that says, uh, well, you know, there are, I don't know, hundreds of billions of lines of code in the open world, right? So that's, uh, that could be quite a resource if you knew how to find uh, the pieces that are out there that, are, that have been proven, that are tested, that work, and then start being, a, find, the, find the, the right pieces of code for whatever it is you're trying to do, and then start automating the assembly of code to do higher level functions. So uh, there's a wonderful display here at the museum that looks at the history of programming languages. And I'd love to see that end up in a, in a future where um, you know, everyone can program, but it doesn't have to be about languages because you're just able to use machines to go to do all of that work that is you know, employing everyone in Silicon Valley. To <laughs> <laughs> George McGovern proposed that part of the U.S. public education system should be funded by the Department of Defense. Your stance on this. Hmm. It, it, let me just step all the way back. If you look at what is driving research and development and technology in this country, uh, there was a time not long ago when about half of that funding was coming from the federal government and about half from the, public from the private sector. Today it's about two-thirds private and one-third government because, in fact, private investment in R&D is growing faster than GDP. You can, you, you can see the intensification of the innovation economy in those numbers. Um, and, and I think that the role of government in, in all of this is is shifting before our eyes. Um, we, many of us grew, grew up in a time when that was the predominant source of research. It was the core driver of a lot of these technologies. And I think what has come from that is these incredibly powerful, innovative industries. Um, but it has, I think the, the, the balance is shifting in ways that are very important for our national security concerns. I think they're also going to come to these core questions of where, how is research driven in our universities? What's going to drive the educational system as well? So it's um, the ecosystem. I actually think our ecosystem is healthy, changing in some ways that are alarming. But fundamentally, I think we've adapted to change after change. And I'm optimistic we're going to adapt <laughs> to these changes as well. And there was a rift with DARPA at one point in the university world. And it seems like that that has been healed. I hope it's healed. I yeah. think they're, they've always been an important part of uh, how we get great things done. Yeah. Thank you for Thank talking you. to us this Thank you. It's evening. so great to be here with everybody. DARPA today is a $3 billion enterprise with more than 250 programs in almost every area of defense. There are hundreds of stories like this at the Computer History Museum. Join us next time for the Computer History Museum presents Revolutionaries.